So good morning, everyone. It's my very great pleasure to have a, a very special Australian guest speaker with us today, Renuka Rambatla, and I'm just going to read out her short bio. Renuka is the co-founder and chief compliance officer at Metacosmos, Viom Tech, PTY LTD. Renuka's qualifications include Master of International Public Health and a Bachelor of Health Science majoring in Public Health and Physiology. Renuka has over 15 years of experience across not-for-profits, health services and quality systems management. She was a co-contributor to the Technology and Global Public Health book chapter, M Health for Better Quality of Life, Healthier Lifestyles and More Meaningful Lives. Renuka's interests are to contribute creative, sustainable and technology-enabled solutions for companies to address various health and social issues in space and on Earth. Renuka has been selected as a finalist for Female Space Leader of the Year, SME for the Australian Space Awards 2024. And uh, Congratulations on that. That's fantastic. So I would like to hand the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Rowena. Thank you so much for joining today. And um, thank you again, Rowena, for the introduction. So I'll be discussing our company, Metacosmos, and we're a Sydney-based startup focusing on the developing protective suits for extreme environments. And I'll give you a general overview of the impact of space travel on human performance and what our company is doing to work towards that as well. So broadly, I wanted to, to discuss the impact of space environment on humans and the purpose of spacesuits and protective suits for extreme environments, how we prepare for a spacewalk, and also the need for an updated um, next generation space suit or protective suits that can be utilized on Earth as well. So in space, as you would have learned throughout your course, that there is multiple hazards and um, NASA has classified five different hazards that can impact humans. So the first one is variable gravity forces in space and on different planetary surfaces. So it could range from microgravity um, and also range all the way up to 28 G that's closer to the sun. And different planets would have their own G forces as well that we would have to be mindful when we're looking at um, going towards Mars or exploring any further planets from there as well. So when we look at space radiation, that's a very big factor in um, protecting humans when we're looking at human space flight. And with the space radiation, there could be multiple factors that will create the um, radiation impact. So we've broadly got three different um, types of radiation in space. So the solar radiation that will come from um, the sun's energy bursts. We've also got radiation that comes from our Earth's atmosphere as well. And then we've got radiation that can um, come from the cosmic rays surrounding space. So it's very important that when we're looking at protecting humans in space, that radiation protection is one of the key factors. And then we also have the spacecraft itself. So the International Space Station can be con classed as a um, confined space because we need a lot of the room to go towards the equipment. So once all the equipment's in, the wires are in, and all the um, food and provisions that the astronauts will be required are put in, there's not a lot of room for the astronauts to move around. That is improving but we're still classing it as a confined space. And um, with the confined space as well, you'll have individuals who will be impacted by uh, um, the variations in their sleep cycle. So when it's all combined, we're looking at it as a full system of confined space and also the distance from Earth that can create a lot of issues for some individuals. So there's a lot of... Um, research and development that goes on prior to the astronauts going into space to ensure that they've had a lot of training, picked people that are able to sustain the long distances and work in confined environments as well. And then lastly, we also have the spacesuit itself. So 
the bulky nature of the spacesuit can cause a lot of hazards for the user as well. So spacesuits can range anywhere from 55 kilos onwards. So the newer spacesuits are around 55 kilos, but the legacy spacesuits were bulkier than that. So imagine wearing that on a, um, a relatively regular basis whilst you're training and then whilst you'll be doing spacewalk. So this can create a lot of issues as we'll have a look later on. So astronauts in space have reported multiple issues during the space flight. This can include body fluid redistribution, the space motion sickness, and then we also have bone loss and which is why there's a strict regime for astronauts to do exercise whilst they're up in space. So um, you would have seen photos of uh, astronauts being on their bicycles or um, lifting weights and um, doing other work that's required at least two hours for their training to maintain their um, bones and muscle mass so that they don't lose that whilst they're um, working up there. And human performance and endurance in space is still relatively not well understood. We've only had a small sample set of um, less than a thousand people who've actually been into space so that um, for us to be able to study the long-term impacts is um, still relatively new. So we're working on limited data sets, but it's improving. And um, NASA, ESA, and some of the other big agencies are looking at doing more simulations on Earth just so that we understand what the impact for astronauts will be once they're traveling further distances. So the lifetime surveillance of astronaut health is a part of NASA's Astronaut Occupational Health Project. So this screens and monitors astronauts for occupationally related injury or diseases. And once they're back on Earth, there's also follow-up studies that have shown that there's been medium to long-term impacts for the astronauts in terms of bone loss or um, neurovestibular system impacts and also higher risk of cancer as well. So it's very important for astronauts when they're training to go into space that there's a rigorous um, regime and then also that they've um, continued the nutrition and the exercise whilst they're in space. And interestingly, they've found sometimes that people are more predisposed due to their genetics for certain conditions such as um, eye and cataract issues or ocular um, issues as well. So we've also got the Human Research Program, which uses research and developing methods to safeguard astronaut health and enables them to prepare for travel for further distances, such as the moon and then to Mars as well. So if we start looking at the spacesuit itself, when the um, astronauts are on the International Space Station, whilst they're inside the craft, there'll be an IVA suit or a suit that the crew will wear to, um, uh, because it's quite a comfortable environment on the spacecraft itself. They simulate most of the Earth's atmosphere. So you have a mix of oxygen and nitrogen. But when they're in the um, space warp, which they call the extra vehicle immobility um, unit, that's the one that you see in the picture, that will be utilised for them when they need to go and fix the ISS station modules or they've got some experiments that they need to run in space so they're required to leave the spacecraft. Uh, so this is the lovely Pillsbury Man type um, suit that they'll have to wear. So the extra vehicle mobility unit or the spacecraft is essentially a portable spacecraft and it provides protection against the harsh space environment. So this could be the temperature fluctuation. It could go from minus degrees to um, very, very hot as well. And also micrometeoroids that might be coming. So whilst they look very small, the micrometeoroids can be going faster than a bullet. So if the suit was to be punctured, it would be quite disastrous for the astronauts. So there's quite a few things that they need to plan for and the EMU suit is quite adaptable as well so we're looking at multiple layers we're looking at different um, modules as well the helmet and the hard upper torso the lower torso that all work together to protect the astronaut 
and they're built in multiple components and layers so that it's easy to uh, fit for a wide range of the population. It takes around 30 minutes to don the spacesuit as well. So it's not an easy uh, suit to get into, but it's required to be that way to provide maximum protection. So if we look at the spacesuit layers themselves, we've got the pressure garment assembly, which is the inner layer, and it's made of a combination of materials such as spandex, urethane coated nylon and other elastic fibers as well. So it maintains a comfortable pressure around the astronaut's body and the layer also helps distribute the pressure evenly across the body. And then we've got the liquid cooling garment, which is the middle layer, which helps regulate the astronaut's body temperature. And it contains tubes through which the cool water passes and circulates. So it removes the excess heat from the um, body during any vigorous activities that the astronauts might need to perform. So sometimes they'll have to go outside the craft and fix um, different parts of the craft, or they might need to deploy any research experiments that have been taken up there. So it can take quite a lot out from the astronaut to be performing these tasks when you're thinking that you're, you've got essentially 55 extra kilos on you. So movement will be quite restricted and you can heat up quite quickly in there. So the next layer, this is also um, the known as the thermal micrometeoroid garment. So this is the outermost layer of the spacesuit and it provides thermal insulation and protection from any fast moving objects in space, or if they were to land on any surface such as the moon, which has um, lunar fine dust called regolith, and this can be quite dangerous for the astronauts as well. You might have seen some photos from the moon landing when they came back to the spaceship as well, that they had a lot of um, dust once they took off their um, spacesuits and this can cause quite a lot of reaction to the skin and also if they've breathed it in. So there's a lot of protocols uh, that they must follow when they're outside and they um, come back in to ensure that they've got rid of all the dust and that there isn't any punctures on the spacesuit as well. So the micrometeoroid um, garment as well consists of multiple layers. So there's um, materials such as aluminized mylar, dracon, and other insulating materials. And the uh, white color of the suit also helps reflect the sunlight and that aluminum, uh, aluminized mylar reflects the sunlight to regulate the temperature, while the other layers um, inside are also providing insulation. So it really helps to protect the large fluctuations in temperature in space. And then the uh, hard components such as the hard upper torso also provide structural support for the spacesuit's upper body, including the torso, shoulders and arms. And we also have a life support system, which I'll show you a little bit later, and a communication equipment as part of the helmet and controls for the suit as well. So the hard upper torso is made of the rigid composite materials and it protects the astronaut from impacts and provides a mounting point of view for various points as well for the inner layers. So um, it's quite a complex engineering project to create these space suits. And um, there's been a lot of research done into how they can best create them, whether it's pressurizing through gas or using materials for elastic compression for the body. So um, at the moment, it's quite an exciting time as we've got some different companies around the world, such as Collins Aerospace, Axiom Space, uh, Metacosmos, and um, the space agencies as well, looking to see how we can improve these spacesuits so that we can have more access for people to train on Earth or um, for the uh, upcoming missions for Artemis as well. So I briefly mentioned that there's a portable life support system on the spacesuit. So these again are quite complex. 
and they are required to provide oxygen and get rid of the human waste within the um, uh, astronaut as they're um, doing their spacewalks. So they're quite critical and um, they sustain life in these extreme environments. So they can be utilised on Earth in extreme environments as well when they're doing their analogue training and also in um, interchangeable to other industries such as defence. So you'd have modified versions of these portable life support systems. So the one that you're seeing now is the legacy life support system. And they've got seven main subsystems, including a communication system, an oxygen ventilating circuit, and primary oxygen circuit, a feed water circuit, liquid transport loop, an electrical system and a warning system. So it's uh, basically all in one support for the astronaut whilst they're on the um, spacewalk. And we also have battery management systems in there that would provide warning for the astronauts if the battery's running low or if there's any other um, issues that might come up. So they need to be able to complete their work and head back to the station as well. So it's a quite a complex process to prepare for an extravehicular activity. So a lot of the times the astronauts are working on the space station itself. There isn't a regular need to leave the spacecraft unless they're going for maintenance that can't be undertaken by their robotics or um, at the moment they've got some robotic arms that they also utilise for doing um of minor maintenance. So for the large scale maintenance, the astronauts will have to leave the spacecraft. And to do this, they have to do a procedure before they leave so that they can maintain their health. And um, some of the steps that the astronauts undertake is pre-breathing. And there's two airlocks on the space station for ISS. So a lot of the examples I'm using are for the ISS. So with the astronaut pre-breathing, they prepare for the EVA spacewalks by spending the night before in one of the airlocks. And this is also followed by pre-breathing pure oxygen for around two to three hours. And um, depending on how long they'll have to leave the spacecraft for. Um, so this enables them to purge all the nitrogen from their bodies. And then this avoids the decompression sickness that they might have to um, uh, face if they don't purge all the nitrogen from their body. So it's quite a complex process that they'll have to go through, but the systems in the airlock and the airlock at the moment that they use at the ISS is called the Quest airlock. And there's two different compartments. So one houses the spacesuits and the outer one houses and the outer one enables them to exit the spacecraft. So when they sleep the night before, they do a set of procedures and they make sure that their spacesuit is all um, uh, without any tears or there's no issues and um, do any minor maintenance. And then they um, proceed to do the oxygen pre-breathing as well. So in the spacesuit, they would lower the, um, the pressure. So this would enable um, a better pressure differential between the spacesuit and the outside space. And that also helps in um, avoiding deep compression sickness. So some of the legacy spacesuit challenges that we've seen um, that have been reported from astronauts that have utilised it is that there's a um, bulky nature of the spacesuit itself can lead to injury. So this is where um, our area of focus is that we're looking to create less bulkier spacesuits that will reduce the harm to the user whilst they're training or whilst they're um, in the spacewalks themselves. And a lot of the um, previous uh, injuries that were reported were self-reported because the spacesuit itself didn't have mechanisms for um, monitoring things like a range of movement or monitoring the pressure that might be put on a shoulder or other areas of the body. So some of the pressure suit impacts that we can see um, range throughout the whole body. So if we start from the um, cervical spine and there's a reported neck pain, there's herniated nucleus pulposus, and in the shoulder as well, it can create a lot of strain. And um, with the rotator cuff, 
there's been uh, overuse and also the situs that's been reported. So just the movement that the astronauts make to do their regular activities is causing a lot of issues. And then in the elbows, there's been a damage to the soft tissue and the cartilage. Um, in the hands, there's a lot of fatigue, a strain and sprain and swelling. With the fingernails, there's a lot of bleeding as well. So there's a lot of work that's been undertaken at the moment on gloves to ensure that they reduce the amount of um, sore cuticles and sublingual bleeding, uh, bleeding as well. In the lumbar spine, we've also seen a uh, space adaptation back as well. So um, there's herniated nucleus pulposis there as well and just multiple issues that they're facing with their feet and ankle um, from just irregular abrasions to Achilles tendon ruptures as well, and also the hard contact injuries as if they go onto a surface as well. So um, yeah, the spacesuits themselves aren't um, the solution to everything. They provide protection for space radiation, for enabling better movement in microgravity, but there's also some risks that are associated with uh, um, a long-term use of a spacesuit. So when we're looking at doing missions further in um, uh, other planets, such as Mars, or if we want to go beyond, we'll have to be mindful that the spacesuits are also designed so that the EVA activities can be sustained for a longer period of time. So uh, the EVA suits at the moment provide up to nine hours of support. The newer suits are looking at doing 12 hours or more, providing oxygen and um, providing uh, other sustenance so that they can maintain longer work hours. So this is just a close up of some of the pressure suit impacts that the astronauts have reported. So it's not, uh, yes, a fun experience to be in long term. So you wouldn't want to be in there for hours. And um, this is what we need to work on at the moment is how do we protect the individuals from the harsh environments yet also provide some sort of comfort so that they're able to undertake their work without issues. Mm -hmm. So um, this is also some of the points where we've noticed that there's been space-induced injuries. So as we mentioned, there's um, rotator cuff tendonitis and bursitis. And some of the engineering that we're looking into at the moment with our company, Metacosmos, we're a startup that began in 2020 and we're utilising NASA's technical standards, new engineering methods, and manufacturing processes as well that uh, um, advance 3D printing to be able to create the next generation spacesuit and um, reduce the bulk overall for the suit that we saw compared to the legacy suits, provide a smaller portable life system so that we'd be able to um, reduce the overall weight as well of the system and then provide some tentacles that can also um, help the astronauts uh, conduct their missions, such as if they need to drill on the moon, they need to take photographs hands-free, or they need to collect samples of regolith or um, other samples that they might see on other planetary surfaces. So at the moment, we've got a um, product range that we're developing. So model Terran, we're looking at developing for land-based activities, are conducting analogs on earth so if you might go to harsh environments in the middle of the desert to simulate what the environment in space will be like would um, be utilizing the model Terran model aqua for deep sea diving operations and also model Viome, which is the one we're ultimately looking at putting in space and then all of these are um, in, with the base layer of the sensor suit. So the sensor suit is a um, base layer that looks at tracking body vitals for astronauts and users that may be on Earth or for training purposes as well. So we'll um, have a little video that I'll show you. Welcome to Metacosmos. Our aim is to generate critical human intelligence in extreme conditions across land, sea, air, and space. Cosmosuit, our proprietary intelligence gathering platform, is an intelligence gathering solution. Model Terra for land, model Aqua for sea, model Viome for air and space with a base layer called Sensor Suit. 
The heart of this system is the connected telemetry software. The built-in suit intelligence generates suit and user biofeedback, receive multimedia inputs, upload multiple sources of data, integrates with command and control operations, and offers real-time intelligence. So the idea behind the suit is to provide a next generation approach where we want to ensure that we're monitoring the individuals using the suits and also astronauts whilst they're in space in real time so that we'd be able to see the injuries that we saw before. Um, we'd be able to monitor and say, look, the uh, heart rate of the individual is spiking or the movement that they're doing in their suit is going beyond the range of motion that they should be doing. So we need to make sure that they compensate. So we'd like to be able to do a more detailed analysis than what is being provided at the moment for astronauts. So the idea is to prevent as much injuries as possible whilst they're doing their activities rather than it being reported after and then we're having to compensate and do a lot of physiotherapy or other activities after to bring the individual back to baseline. And the way that we're looking at the spacesuit is in modular parts. So we've got an expanded view of our spacesuit that I'll just show you. So we're looking at putting that human in the center, looking at all the components from the spacesuit and what we can do in each part of the spacesuit that will help for a better um, mobile astronaut. And then they be having less layers within the suit as well so that there's extra movement and also greater protection from the outside harsh environment. So we're looking at how do we improve the temperature support systems, the liquid cooling garment. So basically an end-to-end -end redesign of the whole spacesuit to ensure that we're able to offer better protection. So some of the work that we've also undertaken with universities has been to look at the biomarkers for human body and um, the standard pack that we're looking at doing is to provide your basic um, blood pressure, how you're breathing within the suit, the body temperature regulation, and also the um, position of the individual, uh, what um, a sweating might be also happening for the individual, their oxygen um, and breathing rate. So we're basically looking at a whole suite of biomarkers and we worked with um, CSIRO as well to undertake some research. So we've had some PhD students assist us in looking at a variety of biomarkers that we would need to track to ensure that the um, astronauts are well protected whilst they're in training and also whilst they go on their missions. So if we also look at the human form, you would um, know that we each have around 230 joints approximately in our bodies, and most of these joints have one possible path of movement or degrees of freedom. So when we're looking at supporting astronauts, we need to also look at the number of degrees of freedom that we can utilize and how the form of the spacesuit will naturally support this rather than going against it or creating a further limitation on the movement. And then we also have to look at the muscle, muscular level as well um, and think about how each movement can create, um, uh, I guess, a more energy efficient activity. So you don't want to um, make the astronauts fatigued whilst they're in space because they've already got the bulk on them. So how do we create a system that can work with them rather than against them? So we've also looked at biomechanics as well whilst we're designing our suits to make sure that we're getting the balance right between the musculoskeletal movements, how they expend their energy and what can be um, providing stability to the individuals as well. And so we worked with uh, UWA here in Perth a few years back to look at all the biomechanical movements within the body and how we can um, create a, a virtual models to simulate what it would be like to be um, running in the moon, running in different planetary surfaces and how we might create spacesuits that would support the different environments. So we looked at the peak joint angles and the range of motion that the spacesuit can provide as well when we're doing flexion and extension and other activities within the um, basically general astronaut tasks and what activities they might have to do.
We also looked at um, the tasks that they might have to do within the space station and then on surface operations as well, so that we'd be able to get a bit more of a better understanding of what movement that is undertaken. And then we've also looked at the environment side of things, so different uh, planetary surfaces and the gases that might be um, contained within them and the atmosphere, so how we would have to uh, modify the suits for a Mars environment or how we would have to modify it for a moon environment versus um, just operations on microgravity and the spacecraft itself. We've also looked at the cognitive burden and the um, behavioural side of things for the astronauts. So ensuring that we can monitor their cognitive load, monitor their fatigue levels and monitor um, other aspects that are quite critical. So a combination of all of these, we're looking at generating the unique bioastronautic insights on the individual. So looking at the cognitive area, the biomedical, where along with the biomarkers that will be included and provide a full picture for the individual and anyone supporting them, such as their flight surgeons or medical teams back on Earth, and um, on their um, behaviour and then also their current state so that they can um, be at their optimal whilst they're undertaking their mission. And we're also providing suit diagnostics as well. So to check that, um, okay, the suit might need maintenance in a month or the suit might need immediate maintenance so that they can have a um, wide range of support services available to them. So the sensor suit layer that we're looking at is the base layer. So it provides injury protection, the thermal management and biomarking tracking through the sensors that will be embedded. And then these are some of the predicted performance simulations that we would do is you would have a software and a suit to be able to wear, and then you can predict how you would perform within different simulated areas, whether it's the moon, whether it's on Jupiter, or whether it's on um, spacewalks in other planets. So thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have as well as part of the session. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. I, I think that conveyed so many useful insights into space suits and the role that they play and the research that's needed to create better space suits for the future and um, and just just how complex they are, all all the different components and how they fit together and um, and I think that that uh, biomedical monitoring aspect is is a really important thing for all of us to to think about because we're we're essentially putting somebody inside what's a somewhat hostile environment, and to to be able to check their well being is is a really important thing. So so thank you very very much indeed. And please, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to unmute put your question in the, the chat because we've got plenty of time today. Yeah, sure. Um, I see that there's been a question. Um, Delaney, thank you. And um, so you were wanting to know a bit about tracking of certain biomarkers, specifically about the role of heart rate variability in space and what this might be used for. Okay, sure. So the biomarkers that we're tracking would be only the essential ones that we've um, heard that the astronauts were um, quite keen on knowing and their flight surgeons would want them to be monitoring. And the heart rate variability is quite an important one because when they're in um, the spacecraft itself, it might be different conditions, but whilst they're in the EVA walks and they're undertaking quite critical tasks, there might be a change in that. And um, we want to be able to monitor their baseline when they're on Earth versus when they're inside the craft and then once they go outside of the craft. And what we're um, looking at doing is providing that um, uh, as a real-time monitoring and it would be utilised for looking at what their baseline is versus what they're doing when they're um, on their activities. So 
So we want to ensure that there isn't going to be any cardiovascular issues that might happen um, as a result of them doing their spacewalk. So is there something that we can do to prevent it? There might be something that we have to do for training prior to them going onto the spacewalk. It might be um, an exercise regime or it might be a nutritional regime that we have to look at. So there's multiple um, uses for why we would track that. I hope that's answered your question. Perfect. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm I'm Loshi. I had a question on the um, pressure suit impact regarding the legacy suit. Yes. Um, how much of the injuries are due to the suit itself versus operating versus operating that suit in microgravity? Yeah, and that's a really good question. We're looking into more research on that. On Earth as well, when they're doing their training in their neutral buoyancy labs or on analogs, they have reported that there's been um, uh, injuries with the suit. It's to do with the layers that might be causing friction on the skin, or it could be the movement when they're lifting um, that they've uh, caused a, a physical injury to themselves. So um, with the research versus what it is on Earth and on microgravity, I'm not too um, clear on the differences. So I'll have to potentially look at that and get back to you. But I do know that there have been injuries recorded when they're doing the activities on Earth as well. So it could be a combination of both. Thank you. I uh, just had a follow-up, hmm. uh, another sure. suit question. Um, the biomedical monitoring, does that data go back to this spacecraft or does it go back to earth as well as well yeah so we're looking at for it to go back to the earth so there might be medical researchers monitoring that individual and space mission, and mission controllers and um, the vision is that it would be real time and go back to the earth but as you know there is a delay depending on where they are whether they're on the surface of the moon or if they go to mars this if they're outside the spacecraft so we also have that onboard suit computer that will download the data so if it's not real time it'll, it's essentially like a black box that will house it and then they can go back and share that information with their medical teams so again with the information sharing it would only be uh, on the, um, the consent of the astronauts and the idea is when we're monitoring and gathering all this data it's to help protect them so it's not something that would be widely shared but just to the people that require it and would be able to support the astronaut thank you very much any other questions i might ask a question if that's okay yeah of course two two questions the the first is in terms of um you were saying that there's so much variability in individual at anatomy and things and and I was wondering, um, have you looked at developing digital twins for individual people in terms of tailoring a spacesuit for for them to to try to avoid some of those friction type injuries and and so on? Yes, I am. We're working with a few different universities at the moment. We are also looking at um, New Zealand. Uh, we've got a program called BioBridge between Australia and New Zealand, and we're going there later this year. And we've been in conversations with their um, team that works on digital twins. So they were mapping basically on a cellular level of the human body to create a digital twin. So we were looking at, to see whether we can incorporate that into our design, but certainly we will be using that. And we're also working with um, the SRN project with the university on the East Coast to look at digitally optimizing the fit of the suit. So um, again, we would be targeting 99% of the population to ensure that we have a good fit for that individual and for our model as well in the future, because we're looking at commercial spacesuits. So um, the spacesuits that we offer wouldn't just be for astronauts, but we're looking at targeting people who are quite interested to have their own suit to be able to train. So people who didn't get to be astronauts and go on space mission but have all this training behind them and they would like to continue that practice or it might be um, agencies who would get the suit to train their 
um, uh, uh, cadets and things like that. So for them that we would be offering that platform where you can create your own suit, it would be modular, it would be based on your design specifications as well. So that's one of the advantages that we um, have as a company because we're quite new. We can develop all of these whilst we're in our manufacturing phase, whilst we do our 3D models. So everything will be built so that it can cater for a wide range of audience. Yep. And fantastic. That's all very exciting to hear. And just while we're waiting for other people to think of questions, I, I had um, one a comment slash question uh, I've spent about 20 years working in ski patrol and one of the things that, that I've noticed in that sort of cold environment is that when people start to get a, a little bit hot, cold, they, they sort of get slightly hypothermic in terms of their, their core temperature drops below normal. And I've, I've noticed that at that point people start to appear to start to get more tired and sort of fatigue starts to, to set in. And, and of course, these are things that are associated, uh, known to be associated with moderate to severe hypothermia, but I'm sort of in, intrigued by that connection that, that perhaps just a slight drop in body temperature might then be, be linked to fatigue. And it sounds to me like perhaps with the biomonitoring that, that you're doing, that, that there might be a possibility to sort of cross, cross link that, that data and actually research aspects like, like that that could ultimately be interfering with, with performance. So I'd just be interested in your, your comment on that. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the reasons why we would like to offer that monitoring option is to see um, what people are operating at baseline on earth and then how their body changes with different environments that we're not used to. And certainly the um, what we're looking at is when we're developing the helmets is to um, perhaps incorporate something that might monitor the fatigue levels through eye movement or um, maybe able to monitor the um, brain activity as well in the future, depending on the level of technology and how it would work in space and um, offer that so that we can stop individuals from either passing out in space or having um, further brain injuries due to levels changing with temperature and oxygen. So that is um, a fascinating topic. And we're seeing every day that there are concepts out there that are looking to monitor all this. But again, it just depends when we get to our manufacturing phase, what is um uh, able to be done versus what is practical as well because we have to make sure that the system is kept to minimum bulk yeah there are certainly ways to monitor that in um, several aspects great yeah. thank you very much and i think we we have another question Ah uh, yes, yeah. So the space that have mechanism to protect against radiation. Yeah, the layers that are um, built into the spacesuit, the outer layers, have some protective radiation shielding as well. So on Earth, um, we would have suits that people utilize to go to a radiation and nuclear facility. So similar to those materials in space, they have different layers that will help protect it protect against radiation so obviously the radiation dosage that we would get on earth I think it's around 33 millisieverts a year this would um, in space be radically higher and um, there's a combination of um, materials and sprays that they would put onto the fabric itself that protect against that and again it's not going to stop all radiation but it would just limit the exposure for radiation for the individuals and um, along with multiple other steps that the astronauts would take, such as limiting their time when they're doing spacewalks and then also um, activities they might do once they're back on the spacecraft, that would all help um, reducing the amount of radiation that they um, would absorb. And um, we, Rowena and I went to the European Space Agency in March and we saw that they were running experiments on um, using radiation vests in their um, uh, in the spacecraft itself because they can still take in a lot of radiation whilst they're inside the spacecraft. So it's interesting to see they're looking at new materials that would shield against that. But yeah, certainly the spacesuits do offer some level of protection. 
just um, on on that subject, um, one of my colleagues up in Sydney has recently been speculating about potentially incorporating um, boron into spacesuit fabrics to protect against radiation. And um, just just wondering, have you come across anything about that? Yeah, we've definitely seen different um, um, utilization of uh, materials and components as well. The CSIRO and um, other research institutions are looking at developing new materials as well. And we've done some university projects to see what type of materials that we can create, combinations of materials that might help reduce that. And we're still undergoing some research in that. So can't give you a definitive answer on what the material will be, but there certainly are um, parameters that they're looking at. We've also had discussions with ANSTO that um, are looking at developing some, um, I guess, parameters. So what materials and at what levels of um, radiation that particular material can absorb. So it's still very uh, new, I guess, the um, idea of creating new materials for space, especially when we try and venture further on to Mars and other planets. But um, yeah, they are looking at some different aspects compared to the legacy space suits. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so I had a question around injury prediction. Um, mm -hmm. have, has there been any existing source solutions on, on Earth or industries where you've drawn upon or is it, has it been something that you've really had to look at in-house to create a solution around that? Um, there's actually some great examples on Earth in sports. Um, uh, I guess the, they're looking at injury protection in high-impact sports, so where they would keep extra padding. So in our design, you might have seen that it kind of looks like we've got knee pads and shoulder pads and um, elbow pads. So things like that we've drawn from the sporting industry where you might require further padded support for the synovial joints or protecting other sensitive areas. So um, we've drawn upon that and then we're doing further research in how can we use new materials in those areas to make sure that um, if the astronaut, and unfortunately you would have seen videos of astronauts falling in um, the moon surface, things like that, when they lose their balance or they don't have a sense of where their body is positioned to the environment we want to make sure that the areas where they might have regular falls the elbows the knees and the legs will have that added layer of protection and um, so it's quite complex in terms of when we're doing the research as well for those we would look at the material side of things and then we'd look at biomechanics like predicted falls how people might um uh, fall and the impact of it so that all adds into how we would create the layers and how bulky they might be in certain parts thank you okay we've probably got time for one one or two more questions if anybody has a, a last question you would like to ask before we finish no well i think you've wowed them all <laughs> so thank been, you it's been really <laughs> fantastic and i think it's it's been really exciting to to hear about something that's so cutting edge and is is looking at taking us into the the future both in terms of human space exploration to the moon and mars and potentially beyond but but also the terrestrial applications that you're thinking about as well so thinking about extreme environments in a very holistic way so i think that's really fantastic and we really appreciate you uh, giving up your um, first thing in the day time to come and uh, talk to us today and answer all the, the questions. It's uh, It's been been really exciting and I think one of the, the good benefits of things like going on the, uh, the delegation to the European Space Agency was getting to meet other people who are involved in the space industry here in Australia and so to have the, the opportunity to, to share that with, um, with all of you I, I think is also really exciting and really beneficial. And um, so I'd like to say a very, very big thank you to Renuka and also to Kariti for coming along today and um, spending time with us and being there to answer questions. So thank you again. I think we'll be really excited to hear where things, things go from here. And perhaps uh, we can get you back another time to talk about how things are progressing. 
Yeah, thank you so much for everyone for joining today and for the discussion that we had. And um, yeah, really happy to answer your questions as well. So if you've got any further questions in the future, please reach out to us and um, yeah, follow our journey. So it's always exciting to hear from medical students who are looking into research as well. So yeah, we'd be happy to continue the conversations. And again, thank you Rowena for inviting me here. It's been really good to learn from your students as well from the questions they're asking and from yourself as well and all the hard work you're doing in the space health sector as well it's yeah truly inspirational oh thank you well well likewise <laughs> so can we just say a very big thank you to Renuka for for coming along today and i think that's that set us off to a really great start for the week so uh, so thank you again and we we look forward to future developments thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your week hope it's not too drizzly there <laughs> Thank you. So I think it's going to be uh, cool and 17 for the whole week. So hopefully you'll get better weather where you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.